knowing where my eyes burn. It was like James D. For sure. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 worst SNL musical performances. Another one. Yes. Hands in the sky like this. For this list, we'll be looking at the poorest and strangest musical performances in the history of Saturday Night Live. We will not be including intentionally controversial moments like Sinead O'Connor ripping up a photo of the Pope. Did you enjoy any of these performances? Let us know in the comments. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to check out the full song at the link below. Number 20. Backstreet Boys March 14, 1998 was actually the last episode with Norm Macdonald as a regular cast member. He did not deserve to go out with this. The, love, this been a of mine. the Backstreet Boys were everywhere in the late 90s, so it was only a matter of time before they made their way onto SNL. The boys performed their hit song, As Long As You Love Me, to a chorus of screaming fans. I don't care. While there's nothing really wrong with the performance, it's just so, so corny. It represents the late 90s in all the silliest ways possible, with a hilarious choreographed dance, soulful harmonizing, and even a musical breakdown where the boys play with some chairs. Ah, uh, it was a simpler time. Number 19, Brian Wilson. And speaking of time capsules, let's head back to the mid-70s. The night of November 27, 1976, saw a number of legends on the SNL stage, including host Jodie Foster and musical guest Brian Wilson of Beach Boys fame. Well, I'm going back this summer to Ohio. Wilson was in a bad place at the time. He had recently become a recluse, was suffering from substance use disorder, and his wife was threatening to have him institutionalized. It resulted in a rather bizarre and borderline tragic appearance. Wilson's voice was clearly strained, and he struggled to hit the notes that his younger and healthier self put on record. His energy was also clearly lacking, and the show ended with a weirdly subdued performance of Good Vibrations inside a sandbox. I'm picking up good vibrations. She's giving me the excitations. Number 18, Eddie Money. A successful singer from the 70s and 80s, Eddie Money is famous for a number of hit songs, including Two Tickets to Paradise and the Grammy-nominated Take Me Home Tonight. He appeared on Saturday Night Live on March 18, 1978, playing both Two Tickets to Paradise and Baby Hold On. Money was famous for his raspy voice, but this performance took that concept to the uncomfortable extreme. Baby, hold on to me, baby. Money certainly had the energy, but his shot voice just wasn't there. It seemed a little raspier than usual, like he needed one good throat clearing before continuing on. Unfortunately, that throat clearing never came. Number 17, Red Hot Chili Peppers. As of 2023, this iconic rock band has appeared twice on the show, once in 1992 and again in 2006. The former was significantly sloppier. Sometimes I feel like I don't have a partner. The band does what they can, but there's just no covering John Frusciante's slipshod and out of tune guitar playing. Frusciante was going through some major personal problems, suffering from substance use disorder, hating the fame, and isolating himself from the rest of the band. Just three months after their appearance on SNL, Frusciante would quit for the first time. This mini-concert represents everything that was troubled within the band, with singer Anthony Kiedis believing that Frusciante intentionally sabotaged the performance just to mess with his friends. Whatever the reason, it was an unmitigated disaster. Number 18. 
Number 16. Greta Van Fleet 2019 was a great year for Michigan rock band Greta Van Fleet, as they broke out with their second EP, From the Fires, and won the Grammy for Best Rock Album. They were also the musical guests on the night of January 19th, playing Black Smoke Rising and You're the One. The latter performance is now legendary, having been relentlessly mocked and parodied on TikTok. It reeks of the 70s, down to the outfits, rock and roll sharing of the mic, ridiculous gesturing, and the zonked out looks of the band members. It's certainly unique, we'll give it that. Number 15. The Go-Go's This iconic all-female rock band was on top of the world in 1981. Their album Beauty and the Beat was a huge success, popularizing the new wave movement and spawning the singles Our Lips Are Sealed and We Got the Beat. Both were performed on SNL on the night of November 14th, but let's just say that it wasn't a good representation of the band's talents. Singer Belinda Carlisle admitted that the performance was terrible in her autobiography, writing that the band was under the influence of substances. Well, that much is obvious. They look completely lost on the stage, and each is in their own little fuzzy world. The music itself was fine, but the women looked like half-asleep bar patrons on karaoke night. Number 14. The Pogues this Celtic punk band, known far and wide for their Christmas song, Fairy Tale of New York, performed on SNL on the night of March 17, 1990. Like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, the Pogues were in the midst of a turbulent period, with frontman Shane McGowan often causing problems with his heavy drinking. The SNL stage sees McGowan wearing sunglasses, smoking a cigarette, and slurring his words to the point of complete incomprehension. There was also a complete lack of energy. While the band goes hard on the instruments, McGowan just stands behind the mic and sluggishly nods along. In the closing moments of the song, he picks up a drink and goes to sit by the drums. He was fired the next year. Number 13. The Rolling Stones The band that needs no introduction has only performed once on SNL on the night of October 7th, 1978. They did three songs. Shattered, Beast of Burden, and Respectable. Shattered went off well, but the wheels started coming off with Beast of Burden. Mick Jagger tried to add some snap to the show with flamboyant movements and gestures, but they couldn't mask his horrible voice. We don't know what happened here, but his singing is ridiculously flat and raspy, like an untrained singer trying to do his best Mick Jagger impersonation. Maybe the cigarette that he is openly smoking on stage has something to do with it. Number 12. DJ Khaled This DJ and rapper closed out the show's 44th season on the night of May 18th, 2019, and he did it in style. Hands in the sky like this. He performed five songs through two medleys and honored the late Nipsey Hussle, who was killed shortly before the episode aired. He was also joined by some modern hip hop and R&B legends, including SZA, Lil Wayne, and fittingly, John Legend. But many fans believed this was a case of style over substance, like DJ Khaled was using his clout to mask his lack of activity. This DJ Khaled! This Meek Mill! Indeed, DJ Khaled himself didn't really do anything but bounce around and interject with the odd statement. He's a hype man who's awkwardly hanging around and letting his guests do all the actual work. Keep taking me higher and higher. Number 11. MC Hammer Few artists represent the early 90s quite like MC Hammer, 
The superstar pulled double duty on December 7, 1991, both hosting the show and performing three songs. I got sweat running all over my chest. I don't quit, no, I just press harder than I ever did before. Unfortunately, none of them were any good, and weirdly enough, You Can't Touch This was completely absent from the set list. Even worse, two of the three songs, Adam's Groove and This Is The Way We Roll, were made specifically for the Adam's Family movie. This represented the general shoulder shrugging nature of the whole ordeal. I'm it back to when I first got started. A lot of MC shows, they broke hearted. Hammer's star was fading, and this obvious advertisement of a show seemed like a last ditch effort to stay relevant. We love the Adams family, but come on, when you get MC Hammer, you have to do You Can't Touch This. This is where we roll. I'm rolling. Number 10, Meatloaf. 1978 was a big year for Meatloaf. The actor slash rock star was hitting dizzying heights thanks to the success of the Bat Out of Hell album. This was enough to land Meat an appearance on SNL, a platform that would catapult him to the masses and a new level of fame. Okay, oh, wait, my hand's caught in my hair. <laughs> Introduced by veteran actor Christopher Lee with a groan worthy joke, Meatloaf and company were poised for a great performance. Until Mr. Loaf begins to sing, that is. That will never change the way that I feel. Between rocky and shaky, his vocals never quite come together. Notes both high and low go unhit, and even his team of backup singers seemed bored and frequently wander off key. Oh, Number 9, Troy Sivan. When Troy Sivan appeared on SNL in 2018, his performance of My 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 split the room, or at least the Twitterverse. Oh my my my. I die every night with you. While Sivan won some new fans, or at least reaffirmed some old ones, others were not so kind. Commentary ranged from viewers not knowing or wanting to know who he was to questioning exactly why he was so damn wet. But these were the kinder comments. Others took his dancing to be a lame attempt at being sexy, others deemed him an Aaron Carter wannabe and a dancing and singing lizard boy. Yikes. Number 8, Iggy Azalea featuring Mu. Iggy nailed it here. If you're a fan of her music and brand, you were sure thrilled with her performance. The trouble here is Mu, a Danish singer with a long list of collaborators. This was Mu's first appearance on American TV, and oh, how it shows. From the moment she wanders out, the segment comes off like a scrapped sketch from an unfeatured player working through their two weeks notice. She would later cite microphone latency issues as the source of her troubles, but that hardly explains her off dancing and sixth grader in a school play stage presence. Number 7, Chris Gaines. Who's Chris Gaines? He's the Australian-born, pre-emo late 90s rock star, of course, or in reality, a soul patch wearing Garth Brooks in a Beatles wig. There's a lot to unravel here. As an artist, Gaines did have a Billboard Top 5 hit, making him a quasi-worthy guest. In the Gaines verse, however, he was huge. The trouble is while the character had a whole backstory and was ultimately intended to lead a feature film, that film was never made, the general public knew none of this and were instead baffled by a strange game of dress up from the decade's top country artist. Number 6, Fear. Think all it takes to be punk is a couple of power chords and a Californianized British accent? Oh no friend, punk is a way of life. At least it was for fear. Formed by Lee Ving just a few years prior, the band caught the attention of John Belushi, who attempted to get them to soundtrack his film Neighbors, only to see the idea shot down by Studio Brass. <laughs> to make
make it up to them, Belushi petitioned to get them on SNL, despite no longer being a cast member. The result? A studio full of slam dancers, pumpkin guts, and $20,000 worth of damages. Number 5. The Replacements Formerly the Impediments, until the band's rep caught up with them, the replacements were known to like a song now and again between drinks. What a mess of your life, a success. While under the influence, they once played the worst set ever staged at CBGB, to an audience of talent scouts no less. But in 1986, fortune shone on the mats, when the Pointer Sisters cancelled and musical director G.E. Smith invited them to SNL. We are the sons of no one. Rehearsal went well, but the hours before the show were spent getting drunk with host Harry Dean Stanton, and their obvious state, clothes swapping, and an uncleared F-bomb were enough for Lorne Michaels to ban them then and there. Number 4. Kesha She's reinvented herself since, but in 2010, Kesha arguably set the SNL benchmark for awful. I'm talking pennies, I'm on toes, trying on all our clothes. There are all kinds of bad floating around here, from her odd stage presence, which many speculated was due to alcohol use, and lame rapping. This was capped by Kesha asking, Did anyone ever stop to think? But for Your Love Is My Drug, she doubled down on the weird and came out in glow paint. This, aside from being strange to look at, was objectively offensive to Indigenous peoples. The singing was arguably a little better, but still off-pitch at times. Number 3. Kanye West Had a run from you I'm in love with you, but the vibe is wrong, and it haunted me. On SNL, while promoting 808s and Heartbreak, the Louis Vuitton Don launched into Love Lockdown, a track thought by many critics to be the highlight of the album, and a departure for West given that it featured him singing. But did it? I'm not loving you, way I wanted to, say I wanna move, but can't escape from you. For style rather than a lack of talent, West's singing voice for the song was processed via vocoder, a device that converts and musicalizes the human voice. So we're far from in the danger zone. How many times did I tell you for if I make it through? You lose, yeah, you lose. Live, however, this proved incredibly messy, with Kanye's voice cracking, the vocal effect coming through inconsistently, and the backups being cranked up sporadically to cover it. Wes grabbed people's attention with another SNL performance a decade later, when he began playing an extra song that had to be cut with a commercial break, all while wearing a MAGA hat. And he capped things off with an unplanned and unaired speech about President Donald Trump. How could you let Trump be racist? Well, uh, if I was concerned about racism, I would have moved out of America a long time ago. Number 2. Lana Del Rey We've all gotten used to Lana Del Rey, but 2012 was a different time. A few years prior, she was Lizzie Grant, a budding songwriter and up-and-comer. I was like, no, please, stay here. We don't need no money, we can make it all work. Taking on the name Lana Del Rey, she found her first round of fame in 2011 via YouTube, and her star only climbed higher with her second album, Born to Die. Whether you fail or fly, or shoot, at least you try. However, that album was still weeks away when she appeared on SNL in January of 2012, an appearance that was instantly hated. Perhaps due to a case of too much hype with too little proof and substance, or maybe because it was simply underwhelming. Heaven is the place on earth with you. Tell me all the things you want to do. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Ashley Simpson While it doesn't require as much talent as singing, lip syncing is also an art. You have to, well, you have to synchronize your lips to the words mostly, but you also have to really sell it, you know? On a Monday, I'm waiting. Tuesday, I'm fading. These friends are the basics of lip syncing, but it also helps if you're mouthing the right song. 
on stage for her second song, Autobiography, Simpson's disembodied voice began to sing first song, Pieces of Me, which prompted her band to switch tracks, and her to do a merry jig and bolt. I feel so bad my band started playing the wrong song, and I know what to do, so I thought I'd do a hoedown. <laughs> Initially blaming her band, Ashley later said she opted not to sing due to her acid reflux. Do you agree with our picks? Let us know in the comments! And hey, if you're a fan of the song playing right now, be sure to check out the music video for it right here!